we start with a poem from the book More Than Me See I. It's called Marriage. A house divided against itself will certainly come to ruin. God hath made the man and wife a single blessed union. Let not man tear what God hath joined, nor let there not be schism. Infighting and disunity will only yield confusion. The husband cries, wife, submit. The wife asks, where's the love? The fingers point, the blame is cast, a solution seems far off. Each one of us must guard our hearts against pride and selfishness, for these things often rob the home of God's most perfect rest. Know that when one member hurts, the whole body feels the pain. And when one member celebrates, all the members gain. Marriage is the union of two members tightly joined. So when one causes anguish, he will not escape, be warned. Remember, O oh dear husband, how your master loves the church. He gave his very life for her and bestows the highest worth. The church is never perfect and his love does not depend. On her actions, good or lacking, he is faithful to the end. Dwell with your wife in knowledge. You are joint heirs together. Your prayers will be hindered if you fail to remember. Give honour to the weaker and never become bitter. Shepherd her and show her that you cherish her forever. O oh wife, you are his helpmeet. He is your leader and protection. Bear with him in patience, in spite of his imperfection. <laughs> Encourage him and love him. Your impact is profound. A wise woman builds her house, but the foolish plucks it down. May your husband safely trust in you, look well to all your ways, obey the law of kindness and do him goodness all his days. Favour is deceitful, and beauty is truly vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she surely will be praised. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious wife. And as wood is to a fire, a contentious man will kindle strife. So stop that drip, drip, dripping, O oh woman. Please take heed. And man, do not be wrathful. It worketh not the will of God. Marriage in all is honourable. It's God's perfect will. He gave the woman to the man. This plan is perfect still. The purpose is to procreate a line of godly seed, of women meek and virtuous, and visionary men who lead. My subject this morning is the revival in the home. It is very important to say from the outset that I did not grow up knowing about the biblical pattern for the home. I came from a very tumultuous background of several dysfunctional generations. I never knew my uh, biological father. My mother married multiple times and two of my siblings are still in very evil lifestyles. I grew up in an area where youth threw rocks through windows to try and hurt me and uh, there was a lot of violence. A couple of times we woke up to find used knives in our yard, so I don't come from a, a lovely, godly Christian home, though we did have a time of religiousness at one point. And I lay this foundation so you don't think I came from a perfect Christian home, and uh, I still do not live in a perfect Christian home, as my children and my wife will testify. But I was saved out of that mess, glory to God, by His grace. And I come today with much baggage, just like everybody else. And I need to say that even now, we, as I said, are not perfect. And I'm a messenger today, and some of the things I say may not be pleasant. And in my next message, they may not be pleasant, but by God's grace, may we all receive them, because they are the Word of God. When we were married, I said that I didn't want any children. It wasn't that I didn't want them, I just didn't know what the Bible said about children. Our first came along three years after I got married. 
And then after about three boys, Florence was reading some books on uh, what God thought about children and it started me on a search in the scriptures of what God thought about children. And it was life-changing. We surrendered our will to God's uh, design to allow God to uh, give us as many blessings as He would send along. And He really put us to the test then because He sent us twins. <laughs> Being blind, that's a real challenge. <clears throat> well, the Lord, in His wisdom, took our little Esther home, two days old. My wife and I have been married nearly 14 years now and are expecting our eighth child, our eighth blessing from the Lord. We home educate our children and we take the, the uh, precepts of the scriptures to train up our children very seriously and I'll get on to that a bit later. This is all a great challenge as I said because of my disability. But God is gracious. What do I mean by revival in the home? Like personal revival, it requires effort. There are no shortcuts. It is not a matter of simply praying, God give us revival and waiting for God to do what we are commanded to do. A verse of scripture which has been a challenge to me and which puts things very simply is this. In Proverbs 24 verse 3 and 4 it says, Through wisdom is a house builder, and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Revival in the home begins with a deliberate choice to break the cycle of the sins of our fathers and traditions of men and the humanistic, feministic and socialistic baggage inherited from our forefathers and from our education system and by wisdom it is built, not by accident. God has defined three basic institutions, the church, uh, the family, the church and the state. And of course it's the family that I want to talk about today. And it's no wonder that Satan wants to destroy families. Because the family has always been God's atom of society. He hates it with a vehement hatred so that as many Christian families today are disintegrating as unbelieving families. And that is no exaggeration. Either they are disintegrating through divorce or they are disintegrating through the um, adoption of the humanistic way of raising of families. God's pattern for the family has not been taught in the Christian church for many years. And, the, uh, and that has caused many Christian families to look very much no different to the unbelieving families, except for perhaps uh, for you know, a weekly attendance at church. So what I mean by revival in the home is a home in which God's word, love, order is foundational. It is a home in which the father knows and demonstrates that he is under he is the uh, under God the headship the head uh, is under the Lord Jesus Christ the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. His attitude is of a servant willing to lay down his life for those under his care. His role is shepherd, teacher, protector, and provider. The mother's role is helper to her own husband. A home keeper, something very much disliked today. A teacher and co-worker with her husband. Their mission in marriage is to raise godly children, Malachi 2.15, who will in turn raise godly children and raise more godly children until the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a deliberate vision for instilling multi-generational faithfulness. And what a blessing it is today to be here and see uh, Mr. Craig Sr. and Mr. Craig and then to know that his children are walking with the Lord. That's three generations. Praise God! But it doesn't happen by accident. The children are raised, this is continuing, what does revival in the home mean? The, the children are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and educated according to the scriptural pattern of family-based discipleship. 
They are prepared for a purpose, sharpened and straightened, and as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Psalm 127. I'll hear my son recite that in a little while. Is Amos back yet? He is good. You can come up here in a minute, Amos. In fact, come up here and stand next to Daddy now. To be used in the spiritual warfare, they are to be those who are soldiers. They have to endure hardness as soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to come here and enjoy this world like the world. No, we have a purpose. Our family has a purpose. We are not to be entangled with the affairs of this life, such as the latest... uh, The latest fashions, sports or pop idols, movies or video games or subculture or slang or fashion or fad or immodesty or anything else. We'll deal with some of those things later. They have a mission to take dominion of the world for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, making disciples of all nations, teaching them all that he hath commanded to the glory of God. This may seem radical, and in today's largely humanistic, feministic, materialistic, socialistic culture, it is. It wasn't, however, always radical. Up until recently, maybe the last 200 years ago, this was by far the norm in Christian homes. So today I'd like to look at some of these points. I want to look at the role of the father, the role of the mother, uh, children, discipline, education... By God's grace, if we can fit it all in. You know, if we don't do things God's way, we are doomed to fail. Right? Fail. doesn't matter how good our ideas are, if it's not God's design, we will ultimately fail. And you know, people will say, oh, no, it doesn't work. You know, I've had divorces and it doesn't work. Well, I'm sorry, it's God's design and it will work. You better take two. Home education is God's design. It will work if it's done God's way. What I am talking about today is not a family of perfection, but a family governed by the Lordship of Christ with a purpose. So, um, Amos, would you come here? Now, the first time I saw this done, I was quite offended uh, because of my own pride, and I don't do this to highlight uh, Amos. I I do this to encourage fathers what can be done when we apply the sufficiency of Scripture to our family life. So, uh, Amos, would you please recite for us Psalm 127. Amos has only just just turned three. Except... Nice and loud. 127. Nice and loud. Let Lord keep the sea, the rocks run like a pot in vain. In vain for you, we want up early to sit up late, to eat up the dogs of us, to do loudly, Lord, true. I have this, O oh Lord, the fruit of wood is easy, Lord. I was up in the hand of a mighty man, a true old youth. I'm in man that I will walk in the sun, not the sun, but I shall speak with the enemies in the sky. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He's, uh, he was reciting that when he was two, uh, among many other psalms. But this is what we can do. We can fill our children's hearts with the word of God, that they might not sin against him. So let's continue with the role of the father. The, role, the father in the scriptures is patterned as, first of all, head of the family. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Headship does not imply inequality or tyranny. Headship, rightly understood, means servanthood. We, as husbands, are entrusted with loving and cherishing and leading a daughter of the King of Kings. And you know, I have many times forgotten that. We are to take care of this daughter of the King of Kings to the point of laying down our own life for her, just as Christ demonstrated to the church over which He is head. 
This is no light matter of throwing our weight around to accomplish our selfish desires. Headship does not imply inequality, just as God the Son is not inferior to God the Father, nor is the wife inferior to the husband, yet God the Son willingly submits to God the Father, just as the wife is to willingly submit to the husband. Headship, simply put, means that we as husbands are totally accountable to God for everything that happens in our family under our jurisdiction. God is a God of order, 1 Corinthians 14.33. And our families should be places of order. And it starts with the husband taking responsibility. We'll see what happens when this headship is not followed. We are also to be the physical and spiritual protector of the family. Genesis 14, 12 to 16 describes Abraham rescuing Lot. Numbers 32, 6, 32, 17 to 26. Children of Gad and Reuben fight but leave their wives and children in the protection of fenced cities. You know, they're sending women to war today. It's wrong. 1 Samuel 35, uh, 5 to 18. David rescues Abigail. Nehemiah 4.14, Nehemiah instructs the men to fight for their children, for their wives, for their property. Mark 3.27 and Luke 11.21 describes the strong man protecting his house. God himself is referred to as a strong tower, shelter, refuge, I have to skip over all the references here, protecting wings, Rock, fortress, deliverer, hiding place, and shield, buckler, and more. So shouldn't we learn to be husbands from the example of the great protector? We are also to, do, to protect our families against anything which may defile our family spiritually. Whether it be acquaintances... Predatory young men after your daughters, or Proverbs 7 women after your sons, whether it be printed or electronic media, godless philosophies, or false doctrine, perhaps it is the idolatry of sport, music, television, video games, internet, or simply laziness. In fact, we are to do more than protect against, we are to equip our family to handle such warfare. Do you know why you believe what you believe as fathers and husbands? Do your wife and children know why you believe what you believe? Can your family defend your beliefs from the scriptures? Fathers, this is part of our job. We are also to be provider of the family. 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I'm sorry, I didn't say it, the scripture said it. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any man, if any would not work, neither should he eat. Again, God the Father models this. In Matthew 6, 8, he says, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask. He provides our daily bread. He provides every good gift. Do we have to ask for our daily bread? Well, we do ask in the sense of give us a... But, but no, the, the shepherd provides. And we see that from Psalm 23. He is to be the shepherd and main teacher of the family. Do you know, husbands, we've got to teach our families. And you know, even if we don't sit down at the table every night and open the scriptures, do you know we're teaching our families? When we are lazy, we're teaching our families. When we come home or uh, go to church on Sunday and we come home and go off to the sports, we're teaching our families. We are teaching our families every time we open our mouth and every time we walk with our feet and every time we do nothing, we are discipling our families. For good or for bad. You know, Abraham successfully passed on his convictions to Isaac and to Jacob and to Joseph. That's four generations, including Abraham. Did you know that 
Joseph commanded his sons to take his bones back to Canaan. And did you know that it took 400 years before his descendants took his bones and buried them after Joshua? Do you think our descendants will remember what we have told them in 400 years? Do we have a vision of multi-generational faithfulness that extends that far? Psalm 23 was, was quoted last night. It's often it's, it's the most quoted psalm, but if you ever consider it as the pattern for the Father. Does the sheep ever ask for green pastures, of water, uh, uh, still waters, to dwell in the safety of the shepherd's home? You know, we can't wait, uh, often for fa- fathers can't wait to get rid of their children. Send them out. No, the shepherd, the sheep never asks the shepherd. The shepherd knows his role. And he knows his role and he does it without grudging. You know, we are just talking this morning about dear little uh, Jonathan and, um, you know, his sleep. And, you know, one thing I've learned as a father, and I'm still learning by God's grace, is that, you know, our good night's sleep is not our right A roof over our head is not our right. Food is not our right. By God's grace, if we have it, we thank Him. Mm. But we are a people who are so used to our personal peace and affluence that when we have a little baby who cries all night, we think we're hard done by because we can't sleep. But we forget that children are a blessing from the Lord, an unconditional blessing from the Lord. It doesn't say when they don't, when they behave, or when they don't cry all night. When they, when, no, they're a blessing from the Lord. Uh, we've got a CD back there called "What the Bible Says About Children." It's the results of my search of the Scriptures to see why God gave us children, and it's so important. It's crucial, as we'll find out in a minute. The man, um, the man's original sin was abdication from his role. Yeah, well, if you go off and, you know, you just go to the garden by yourself and I'll just stay around here and, you know, if, if the Satan talks to you, don't worry. I don't no, actually, he was with her, but he didn't, he didn't take lead and say no. He, man has abdicated almost all of his roles to, to others. You know, the education of his children he sent to someone else. The discipling of his children he sent to the Sunday school. Provision for his family he's delegated to his wife. Husbands, it's our responsibility. Listen to what Isaiah said of, a corrupt, of the corruption of the roles of men and women. Isaiah 3.12, he says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. We are all warned... In Proverbs 29, 18, that where there is no vision, the people perish. Fathers, if we have no vision for our families, it's time. It's time to get some vision for our families. There is much wonderful material to help us, even if uh, we weren't discipled by our fathers, to break the sins of our fathers. But it's a proactive thing. How do we start? We can start by opening the scriptures daily, even if it's at night, around the table, just for a short time. Reformation has a beginning, but Reformation never has an end. We always talk about the Reformation of the 1600s way back there in the past. No, Reformation must continue. And Reformation doesn't happen just by continuing the preaching of the men of faith of old. No, we have to delve into the the greatest mind of all truth, the scriptures ourselves, and find those truths that haven't been taught and live by them. We have to start by confessing to God and our wives and our children of our failure and our continued failure. And we must start by reading the scriptures, teaching the scriptures to our children. We must be deliberate in our effort for discipleship. You know, I'm always challenged by my wife and I thank her so much for it. You know, when I go off to pray with other men, take the sons. Let them see what daddy's doing. That is discipleship. Amen. Don't separate your children from you. Let them learn from you. You know, it is, foolishness is bound in the heart of children. You let children play with children, well, they're going to learn foolishness. Mm. He that walketh with wise men is wise. Uh, are wise. You know, the first thing I did after uh, Mr. Brother Forbes spoke last night, I took my son up to him and said, Son, this is a man I want you to respect. 
He's 21, 22, a young man who's preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a role model for my son, mm. not the sports idols. Mm. The mother's role. The mother's role in scripture is patterned by a help me to her own husband. Your own husband. Not another man in the workplace. I'm sorry, this is what the scriptures say. Proverbs 31 11 says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Her role is homekeeper, manager of the home, under her, father, her husband's direction. Proverbs 33 13 to 22 uh, has a lot to say. Titus 2 5, to be chased. Uh, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I don't know how many times I've heard this scripture argued away, but if you look right through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, the pattern is always that, the, uh, particularly for married women, but even for, for unmarried women who are trained uh, to be one day married, they are in the home. They are the instructor and main bearer of children, obviously. Psalm 113, 100, uh, sorry, I've got a whole pile of verses here, I'll just read the one that's uh, 139. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a, what? Joyful mother of children, praise ye the Lord. They are a minister of practical help. Proverbs 31, 20 says, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hand to the needy. Luke 8, 1-3 describes women providing for the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples from their substance. Matthew 8, 14-15, Peter's mother-in-law serving. Acts 9, 36, the story, uh, the account, I should say, I might use the word story, the account of Tabitha, full of good works. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. What was the curse given to man? Somebody. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, providing for his family through hard work. Not, not work itself, but through the sweat of his face. What was the curse given to woman? Quick. Labor pain, sorrow, right? How many men today bear his curse Plus the woman's curse. Put your hands up. None? I didn't think so. How many women today are bearing a double curse? Too many. Mm. Too many. Revival in the home has to start with God's design for the family. It's not a question of whether a woman can do a job of a man better. Quite often she can. But whether God ordained her to do that job we must not confuse the roles God hath ordained for the sexes, lest we blur that distinction and defy God's creation order. If men do not provide for their own, God says, not me, they are worse than an infidel. If women are not keepers of the home, God says, not me, they blaspheme the word of God. These are strong words. And my friends and family... This was not the case a century ago. Feminism has destroyed the church and the home. <coughs> there is no such thing as Christian feminism, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. We must keep this distinction in mind as we purposefully prepare our sons and our daughters for the role God has ordained for them, lest they, like us, stumble into it, or worse still, never learn it. Women, raise your daughters to be wives. Husbands, raise your sons to be husbands. Even older men and older women, you are discipling. Even grandparents, you are discipling. Single men and women, you are discipling. Are you being, be, are you like Timothy? Be thou an example of the believers in word, in faith, in charity, in purity. My heart goes out to single mothers. I was saying to a, a dear sister in the Lord last night that boys are not growing up to be men. 
They are irres- they grow up to be irresponsible. Mm. And that's why we have so many single mothers. We need to take responsibility for our sons and train them up. So let's turn to the training of our children briefly. I don't have time to go into the scriptural mandate to train our own children. I know it may be very new to some of you. Um, but Ephesians 6, 1-4 says that we are to train up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, fathers. And that little word, nurture, listen to what it means. The whole training and education of our children that relates to the <coughs> cultivation of mind and morals. The whole training. It's not delegating to someone else, I'm sorry. This little word, nurture, was readily understood by Paul to have the, the Apostle Paul to have the all-encompassing training and education of our children. And we see that when he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for a proof that the man of God may be fully furnished. That same word, nurture, is used there for every good work. We are responsible for the training of our children. Discipleship of our own children. Not the church, nor the state. And this has, had, this has been true throughout history up until a couple of hundred years ago. I'm sorry to say, we have given our children to the state to be educated by the humanists, or we send them to Christian schools who are largely still based on humanistic foundations, and we send them to the Philistines, and we say, here, you train our children, and we wonder why we lose them. And then some people homeschool and they wonder why they lose them as well because they just bring the humanistic school home and that, that's, that's wrong as well. No. You can't separate Christian and secular. We are Christians full time and every little piece of education of our children, which of course is mainly char- it is, it is a huge proportion character, not just academics by the way. Uh, we've, we've got stuck on that. And, uh, as I said, I've got a CD um, at the back table there called The Bibli- Biblical Pattern for the Training and Education of Our Children. It goes through this in great detail, so I, I don't want to belabor the point. Um, I'd like to touch on discipline. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Psalm 89, verse 30, and 30, uh, 30 to 33. That's Psalm 89. Uh, this really struck me when I read this. It says, If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments... If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. It's almost lost on us today. God uses stripes. God uses the rod. Well, why don't we? Hebrews 12, 7 and verse 11 says, If ye endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Where today? For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Well, I'm sorry, certainly today the fathers do not chasten their children. We're told today that it hurts their, their, their psyche if you use the rod. That is rubbish. That is not what the word of God says. He says in verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Well, I agree. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Proverbs 22, 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 29, 15, The rod and reproof giveth wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother shame. Let's be clear, we're not talking about beating our children. Proverbs 22.8 says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. No, we're not talking about that. But we are talking about training our children to know what is expected of them, and correcting them with the rod, lovingly but firmly, so it hurts. James 1.20 says, For the wrath of man worketh not... The righteousness of God. That's about anger, by the way, as well. Do we expect obedience at our first command? Or do we wait 5, 10, 20 times, and then we burst in anger and get the rod out? We just need to get them used to obeying on our first gentle command. And it takes effort, and it takes consistency. And fathers, we must have an active role in this. Even our older children, as adults, must show honour to their parents. Do you remember King Solomon? His mother came in to ask him a favour. And you know what? Even as king, 
He as king bowed in reverence to his mother, showing honour. Mm. How many teenagers uh, today, at the age of 18, they're out the door, they couldn't care less about their parents. Well, I'm sorry, but we've taught them to be like that. Mm. Discipleship doesn't end. It doesn't end. God has given us a tool to correct our children, the rod. We've got to use it. It says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. You know, many people have commented about our children's behaviour when we're out, and we have to say to them, it's not by accident. It's not by accident. It's by training. But when we tell them how, they don't want to know. <laughs> 1 Samuel 15.23 says, for, the rebellion, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Do we, uh, do we, um, do we allow witchcraft into our homes? So we better not allow rebellion. Mm -hmm. And also remember to teach your children that they are also uh, discipling their younger brothers and sisters. There is never a time when they are not discipling. Younger ones must be encouraged to look up to older ones. Older ones must be encouraged to set an example. Older ones also must uh, be uh, watching the adults. We've got to instill this in our children. Children, remember, be thou an example. Be thou an example. Children, watch that man. Children, don't watch that man. Children, are you discipling your younger, children, your younger siblings? The whole issue of discipleship is so important. And fathers, we've got to do that. Mothers, we've got to encourage our, our children. You know, we think that uh, once you come out of the meeting, we sort of we start talking idle chatter. It says, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Matthew 12, 36. Everything we do is discipleship. So, in, in, in summary, revival in the home will only come when we are willing to submit to the Lordship of Christ and fulfil the scriptural roles given us by the Lord Himself. The Father is the head under Christ, provider, protector, shepherd and teacher. He is to have the attitude of a servant, not a dictator. The wife is the husband's helper, not another man's. Home, she is the homekeeper, she is instructor and main nurturer of children and minister of practical help. Children are to be received into our families as blessings from God and raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And this is more than just providing food and clothing and sending them off to somebody else to train them in life skills and academics. We are to fully educate them in the law of God, which is more than just the Ten Commandments. We are to teach our children practical life skills in the framework of God as Creator, the whole counsel of God from aesthetics to zoology, in other words, a biblical worldview. You know, the A to Z of everything of life is to be taught from God's perspective. Yes, it's radical. Yes, it's radical. But it is the only way we will have revival. Did you know that in 1817, just looking at our history, I was remembering Brother, Brother Ford, Ford was talking about this last night. In 1817, the top articles in the newspaper were about the benefits of reading the scriptures at home, around the table. We are also to use God's method of correction, the rod, for foolishness and rebellion, which is as the sin of witchcraft. Our goal as families is multi-generational faithfulness with a purpose. Not just a survival of the day mentality. Proverbs 24.3 as we started. Through wisdom is a house builded and by understanding it is established. Reformation was not something completed in the 1600s. It must be ongoing. You know, we make a lot of evangelism out there. And yes, evangelism is true. But we have failed to see that our family is the atom of evangelism. We can be more um, effective evangelists by raising, our godly, uh, raising godly children than any mission on the field today. Missionary on the field today. I, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. You see, what happens is we get people saved and then we don't tell them what to do. 
You get people saved, you disciple them. We disciple them. We raise them, we disciple them through our family. Bring them into your home. Hospitality, show them. This is how we read the scriptures around the table. This is how we memorize scriptures. This is how we do things. This is how the Lord has taught us to train our children. Will you continue to, uh, by the glory of God, in your home, the revival that is started in your heart, this camp? This is truly where revival in the home begins.